Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today to this uh, first paper session of this arts program 2020. My name is Yun Chung Han. I'm assistant professor in San Jose State University, and I'm co general chair of this arts program 2020 and the moderator for today's paper session on number one. So today we have a keynote speaker talk and two paper presentations and the three invited artist talks. So we'll have a two live Q&A sessions. The first live Q&A will be after keynote talk and the two paper presentations. And the second live Q&A will be after three invited artist talks. So if you have any questions, please post your questions to the Discord VZAP channel. So uh, I'll check it out and then read it uh, for you and our presenters and artists will answer your questions. So first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Sarah Sinwell. So Sarah Sinwell is an assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Arts at the University of Utah. She has published essays on Kickstarter, Green Porno, Riverdale, Dexter in a Companion to the American Indie Film, Women's Studies Quarterly, Feminist and Queer Theory, an Intersectional and Transnational Reader, and uh, Asexualist, Feminist and Queer Perspectives. Her recently published book, Indie Cinema Online, Rutgers University Press, examines shifting modes of independent film distribution and the exhibition on YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, and Sundance TV as a means of redefining independent cinema in an era of media convergence. So the title of her keynote talk is a Representation Matters, Mapping Gender and Sexuality on Twitter. Please welcome Professor Sarah Sinwell. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the ancestral homelands of the Soshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Mute tribes in which I live and work in Salt Lake City, Utah. My name's Sarah Sinwell, and I'm an assistant professor in the Film and Media Arts Department at the University of Utah. I study YouTube, web series, art house cinemas, and female and queer independent filmmaking with a particular focus on the intersections between contemporary American independent cinema and new media platforms. Examining shifting modes of independent film and media distribution and exhibition on YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, and Sundance TV, my recently published book, Indie Cinema Online, redefines independent cinema in an era of media convergence. Overall, my scholarship investigates the intersections between film studies, new media arts, fan and reception studies, media industry studies, and feminist and queer studies. It's informed by interdisciplinary cultural studies and digital humanities research and methods. Today, the project I'm presenting to you is one that is ongoing, and I'm at the only beginning stages of this project. It's called Representation Matters, Mapping Gender and Sexuality on Twitter. And it focuses on how audiences and fans of blockbuster films and franchises, such as Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Batwoman, Black Panther, and Frozen, use Twitter hashtags to create a space for alternative forms of representation in popular media. Pushing against the whiteness and heteronormativity of corporate-sponsored media culture, these Twitter campaigns draw attention not only to the absence of people of color and LGBTQIA characters within contemporary media, but also to alternative possibilities for more inclusive representation and ultimately more visibility and acceptance in society more generally. As a means of discovering the gendered, raced, and sexualized geography of these campaigns, this project maps out the cultural language of these hashtags. Now, before I begin, I'd like to include a few caveats. One is you'll notice there's no images from Disney or Marvel, and that's because of copyright constraints today. But I imagine if I mention Black Panther or Frozen or Star Wars, you know what I mean. Secondly, in my field within film and media studies and fan and reception studies, we argue that one should not include Twitter handles in the discussions that we're having of our Twitter hashtags. So when I've talked about specific quotes from Twitter today, I've deleted the handles. That's for the privacy of the people who've posted those hashtags. 
So in these campaigns, I argue that many of them position marginalized identities as an in-between space, one that is constantly vacillating between its hyper-awareness of racial and sexual difference and its erasure. By taking to Twitter to demand queer representation and inclusion, fans encourage media franchises such as Disney and Marvel to take on the queer project of resisting patriarchy and heteronormativity and promoting queer visibility. In this context, I argue that digital and hashtag activism enables the possibility of creating community across disparate geographies and transnational locations. My project also maps out the ways in which social movements on Twitter function as a contradictory space for political and social advocacy, as well as backlash, both facilitating online activism and cultivating online harassment and bullying. In an effort to create more racial and sexual visibility online, media fans have taken to Twitter, and this includes hashtags like representation matters, we need LGBTQ stories, give us a girlfriend, which I'll be discussing today, give Io a girlfriend, which is based on the character of Io from Black Panther, Captain America, excuse me, give Captain America a boyfriend, and make Rey asexual, referring to the character of Rey from Star Wars Force Awakens. So at the same time, however, actors such as Ruby Rose in Batwoman and Kelly Marie Tron in Star Wars have been forced to exit Twitter and other social media amid a backlash over their casting as the first openly lesbian superhero and the first woman of color with a lead in a Star Wars film. This form of resistance via social media and Twitter campaigns enables online communities to learn about and challenge accepted tropes about gender, race, and sexuality in popular culture. At the same time, it creates an online space for sharing LGBTQIA stories and resisting the broader norms of heteronormative and patriarchal culture. So now I'd like to share with you some of the questions that my project provokes. And like I said earlier, this project today is at its beginning stages. I'm only representing to you a small portion of it, but these are some of the questions that my larger project addresses and some that I'll be addressing today as part of my case study of Gives Elsa a Girlfriend. So some of those questions include, how can gendered race and sexuality, excuse me, how can gender, race, and sexualized identities be articulated on Twitter? What's the scale and geographic spread of these Twitter campaigns? What kind of language are used in these Twitter campaigns? How do fans and anti-fans use hashtags to create a space for their own identities? And how does hashtag activism draw attention to the need for more representation of marginalized communities within Disney and Marvel franchises? Now, like I said before, today we'll be talking about Give Elsa a Girlfriend, but if I'd have more time, I would also talk about the representation of asexual identity in the Make It Very Asexual campaign about Star Wars The Force Awakens, or the Give Io, Let Io Have a Girlfriend campaign about Black Panther, or the Recast Batwoman campaign about Batwoman. But for today, I'll be talking about Give Elsa a Girlfriend. So as part of this project, I analyzed over 8,500 Twitter postings since the Give Elsa a Girlfriend campaign started, starting on April 30th, 2016. And after I analyzed these postings, I noticed a number of themes begin to emerge. The desire to see queer representation in girls and children's media, the need to erase the stigma that only heterosexuality is normal, and the desire to see positive queer role models for children so that queer representation can become more accepted. So as I looked at the GLAAD 2016 overviews of findings, they said that of the 126 releases counted from major studios in 2015, only 22 or 17.5% contained characters who identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And I think it's notable here that when we're talking about the LGBTQIA plus community, the GLAAD overview only referred to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. This means they didn't talk about asexual communities, intersex communities, any other communities that are concluded within the LGBTQIA and the plus of that community. So they point to the lack of LGBTQ characters within contemporary media, but within children's media, queer characters are almost entirely absent. So in response to this, the Give Elsa a Girlfriend hashtag was founded in April 30th, 2016. 
And upon hearing of the coming Frozen sequel in 2019, 17-year-old teen activist Alexis Isabel Moncada posted the following tweet. And Alexis was very public about why she posted this tweet, so that's why I use her name here. Here's her tweet. I hope Disney makes Elsa a lesbian princess. Imagine how iconic that would be. Later that day, she followed up with the tweet that started a movement. Dear at Disney, give Elsa a girlfriend. Many Give Elsa a Girlfriend postings on Twitter advocate for more queer representation in children's media as a means of normalizing queerness. Drawing attention to the erasure of queer representation, as well as the absence of non-white representation within Disney fairy tales, these Twitter users are also redefining the normal and opposing heteronormative ideas of romance and relationships. And another thing I'd like to note here is I couldn't share with you all the fan art that I've collected, that people have shown lots of images of what they would imagine Elsa's girlfriend would look like. This include images of people of color, the Indian community, the disabled community. And if I had a chance here, I would include a lot of those images. Many of these fans are interested not only in giving Elsa a girlfriend, but giving her a girlfriend of color. Here are some examples of the tweets that people posted talking about how the hashtag might enable normalizing queerness. Give that Elsa a girlfriend because we need to erase the stigma that straight couples are normal but LGBT couples are inappropriate for children. Give Elsa a girlfriend because it took Disney 70 years to feature a black princess. Let's not wait that long for a gay one. And here they're referring, of course, to the princess and the frog. Trent Trend give us a girlfriend in hopes that at Disney will consider giving queer girls representation in princess form and give us a girlfriend because straight people aren't the only ones to deserve a fairy tale romance. Pointing out the ways in which the metaphor of the open door in Frozen can be understood in relationship to the gay trope of coming out of the closet, the Give Elsa a Girlfriend tweets encourage queer visibility not just in general, but in Disney and children's media. And here I'd like to point out that when these Twitter posters post about Give Elsa a Girlfriend, they're also referring directly to their love of the film and the soundtrack itself. So songs like Let It Go and Love is an Open Door, these are kind of emblems that have now been understood as iconically queer and almost queer anthems. So a lot of these Twitter posters in enable that discussion even more when they talk about their Give Elsa a Girlfriend campaign. So give us a girlfriend, because half of Frozen is one big metaphor for being in the closet, getting at it, and coming to terms with yourself. Love is an open door that should be open to everyone, not just straight people. Give us a girlfriend. Give us a girlfriend. The younger generation has to know that it's normal that girls like girls and boys like boys. Love is an open door. So these tweets are also a reminder of the very real and very dangerous consequences of the erasure of LGBTQ representation in the media. For instance, many of these tweets address the larger issues within the LGBTQ community, including the need to feel safe, the stigma associated with LGBTQ people, and the desire for queer kids to feel understood and accepted. In this way, extending the notion of the queer to children's and girls' media opens up more possibilities to destigmatize the queer community and advocates for queer representation as a means of building a broader support for queer rights. Here's some examples. Give Elsa a girlfriend because one in five kids are queer, but only one in ten feels safe enough to come out. Give Elsa a girlfriend. Normalizing an F slash F or female to female relationship will help queer young kids accept and understand their sexuality. That rep is so important. Give Elsa a girlfriend, because if there were a gay princess when I was little, it might have been a lot easier to love who I was sooner. When I was a young teenager, I always thought something was wrong with me because I liked other girls. Even a subtle reference to a Disney character like Elsa being gay would have meant the absolute world to me and made me feel less alone. Give Elsa a girlfriend. The possibility that Disney may, however small that realistic possibility may be, give Elsa a girlfriend makes child me want to cry. If I had that representation as a kid, I might have been spared the years of confusion and feeling of not belonging. Further breaking down the codes of heteronormativity and heterosexual romance within the Disney canon, some of these tweets even indicate a desire to keep Elsa single and suggest that Disney should refuse to give Elsa a love interest at all. 
By suggesting the queer notion that a Disney princess be single, Frozen fans contend that making Elsa single would be an equally queer move as giving Elsa a girlfriend. I'm all for giving Elsa a girlfriend, but how about films for kids where the end goal isn't a love interest? Why do we need to give Elsa a girlfriend? Elsa doesn't need a girlfriend or a boyfriend. She's the first Disney princess who's single. No charming prince for Elsa. Don't give Elsa a girlfriend. Let her be badass single and give an LGBT prince or princess a new movie, not a sequel. So you can see here that these tweets are a reminder of both the possibilities and limitations of the Twitter campaigns. If you've had a chance to see Frozen 2, you've noticed, though Elsa wasn't given a girlfriend, the film hinted at a love interest through the character of Honey Marin and allowed her to remain single and happy by the end of the film. By advocating for more LGBTQ representation in Disney films and children's media, fans and audiences are encouraging Disney to break down the traditional coding of the heterosexual romance, and they're also attempting to include LGBTQIA voices and identities within the Disney canon. In these campaigns, sexuality is often constructed in relationship to the larger queer community as a means of creating a social movement and a network of public visibility. At the same time, by dividing LGBTQIA plus identity within the larger cultural zeitgeist of such franchises as Frozen, these campaigns are a means of further promoting queer visibility. Reimagining girlhood and queer sexualities within the canon of children's media enables us to rethink the ways in which queerness is constructed in relationship to gender, sexuality, and creates a space for LGBTQIA coming out online. Thank you so much for listening to my talk today. As I said earlier, this is part of an ongoing project that includes not just Give Elsa a Girlfriend, but also Black Panther, Batwoman, and other representations of queer Twitter hashtags. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments in the Q&A, and thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much uh, for the great talk, Sarah. Um, so next presentation is our, the first paper session, so paper presentation. So the first, uh, the title of the, uh, the next presentation is Heartbeats Visualizing Crowd Effects, presented by Chao Wing Chin. Marius Constantinus and Luca Elias, and then Daniel Corsia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Charlotte Ching, a designer working at the intersection of art and science since 2017. I graduated from the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London. And today I'm presenting a collaboration project with Bell Labs. Together we have created a metaphoric visualization of crowd affects called heartbeats. The world has been going through some historic moments over the past couple of months. And we as individuals have all experienced a large intensity of emotions over this period. Whether it is despair, anger, anxiety, or hope, love, compassion, we ask ourselves, how can we visualize our collective emotional states as a society or as a community? Can we create a representation of these emotions and their complexities that are relatable to all of us universally? So one of the ways of collecting people's aggregated emotion is through wearables. Using technology from an ongoing project at Bell Labs, we can understand, for example, whether people were relaxed or stressed by analyzing the 
the heart rate signals through wearable devices. And this process we call biofeedback. Biofeedback systems translates biosignals such as heart rate into meaningful information about our physiological or psychological well-being. However, the main problem with the conventional visualization in biofeedback system is that the waveforms or diagrams are not connecting with us emotionally. So can we do better than that? Here, we're presenting a project by Lisa Park, an artist who used cherry blossom as a metaphor to illustrate the emotional engagement of the audience. So as the audience interact with one another by hugging or making physical contact, the tree will be blooming with light. This project demonstrates the principle of calm technology, where the experience is designed to interact with the audience through sensory rather than disruptive cognitively. We are also looking for a sensory experience that will represent emotions. And we luckily find our inspiration in nature. Do you remember the last time when you look at the sky and you see the migrating birds flying in a harmonious coordination? What does it make you feel? So we created Heartbeats, which conducts a set of simulated bird flocks that flies across the screen. These bird flocks express a variety of emotions. Heartbeats is a web-based project written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Heartbeats is built based on voice model an algorithm that simulates the emergent properties of flocking behaviors in animals such as birds, fish, and insects, many more. This algorithm follows three simple distributed rules applied to each agent or bird in a flock in relation to their neighbors. These three laws are like forces that steer the behavior of the agents. Cohesion force makes sure that the flock is holding together in one group. Alignment force steer the whole group towards one direction, one goal. Separation force makes sure each member stays in a distance from one another. And there is no collisions in the group very much like how we work in a team. The heartbeat system works as the follows. We take any form of data that describes emotions. In our case, it's the wearable devices that monitors heart rates. So it could also be social media data or tweets. We map this data into eight primary emotions based on Pat Sheik's emotional wheel, a psychological model of basic primary emotions. Finally, these data will be translated into a set of expression, each created by a fine-tuned set of flocking behaviors, which speak to our human interpretations. For example, the positive emotions with more synchronized, harmonious, and the negative ones were very chaotic and uncomfortable to look at for a long time. You are invited to explore these different emotions with our online demo at social-dynamics.net slash heartbeats. On our prototype, you can customize the boy's behavior and their appearances such as color, texture, and you can modify the canvas background color to create your own collage of different emotions. We also conducted user tests online to evaluate our visualizations. 
So 353 participants have participated in our study. Each one of them is asked the following two questions. Question one, which emotion does the visualization trigger? We learned that negative emotions are more broadly recognized and universally differentiated. Our hypothesis is that it could be our evolutionary trade that we're inherently more capable of recognizing and express negative emotions in response to danger. And the second question we ask, does this visualization make you feel relaxed? And the responses we receive tell us that joy is obviously harmonious, soothing, it's rated the most relaxing, followed by trust, surprise, and anticipation, or the positive emotions. On the contrary, anger is the least relaxing visualization to look at. And these responses, these responses validated our design hypothesis and parameter designs. Finally, to summarize, we have created a set of visualizations that transform complex data to abstract but universally recognizable visuals. And this design inspiration comes from nature. We have found locking behavior as metaphors. We build our platform, prototype with voice algorithms, which creates complex behavior patterns with very simple agent-based rules. Finally, our online studies showed that negative emotions are perceived very broadly um, universally and the positive emotions and the visualizations are very relaxing to look at. Thank you for your attention. I hope you get to try our prototype later and let's move on to Q&A. All right, thank you so much for uh, the great talk. Um, we will actually have a live Q&A after the second paper presentation. Um, so please post your question if you might have. Uh, we have this core channel, so please uh, write your question. So we'll have a live Q&A after this second presentation. So our second paper presentation, the title is Suga Convictio, so Visualizing for Ecological Feminine and Embodied, presented by Catherine of Plon. Uh, Molly Wright and then Dara Byron. I'm Catherine Plone, presenting our project Suga Convictio on behalf of my co-authors Molly Steenson and Dara Byrne. This work is my master's thesis at Carnegie Mellon University School of Design. I begin with the simple act of conversation. Last March, in the midst of a global pandemic and political strife, my own graduate cohort at Carnegie Mellon School of Design found solace and support in a ritual we had been practicing together since the fall, reflective conversations in which we could experience a connectedness in the midst of fracture. In her work, Turning to One Another, author Margaret Wheatley calls conversations like these the most ancient and easiest way to cultivate the conditions for change personal change, community and organizational change, planetary change. Indeed, data visualizations are specifically poised for opening the space for profound conversations like the ones my cohort was having. Data viz designers are our attentional guides, choosing which patterns we see and how we can talk to one another about them. I honed my craft in data visualization, admiring designers like Giorgio Lupi, for whom designing with data means designing ways to transform the abstract and the uncountable into something that can be seen, felt, and directly reconnected to our lives and to our behaviors. That is, data visualizations display what we know, which can sometimes be intangible, into visible and discussable patterns, 
giving them the potential to enchant us through showing us new ways to engage with the world, transforming us for the better in the process. Last year, I sat in DC's Art Tech House, mesmerized by Rafik Anandal's Bosphorus, a kinetic data sculpture that is a poetic display of high-frequency radar readings of the Black Sea. Works like these demonstrate that data visualizations, by giving us a feel for the data, can also bring us into the reality the data represents. Bosphorus pulls you in, and you feel the power of water many miles away. You would think that, with these strengths, visualizations could be created as much-needed prosthetics that help us fall into those states in awe and appreciation of wonders unseen in our world. Instead, our data science and visualization theories and practices often fall short of this promise. For example, in the context of community conversations, like the ones my cohort has, in which feeling, perspective, and nuance are key, the extractive qualities and typical practices of collecting and visualizing data come into sharp relief. First, in a typical survey, the unique, felt experience of the body is ignored, and multiple interpretations are discouraged in exchange for consistency. It can sometimes feel extractive. Second, reading a data visualization can be an analytical activity, stemming from the typical characteristics of data visualization itself. Geometric shapes abstract away the people and their stressed bodies they represent. The people in the community are very much isolated in the geometric visuals, despite being very much entangled in the social texture of the community at large. And the truthy aesthetic of geometric data visualizations may dissuade members from questioning whether there are any alternative views of the same community. This approach shapes how a community, much like my cohort, might talk to one another maximizing happiness or the connectivity of our social network. In other words, a typical data viz approach leaves us analyzing patterns, trying to control them. Meanwhile, the tightness in our chest is undiscussed and festering. Beyond this example, many of our data visualizations leave us engaging with the world in a potentially violent mode of control. For years, scholars have critiqued the potentially violent consequences of data collection and visualization, which may sustain relations of domination and exploitation. And in part, violence emerges through historic power relations amplified in data science and visualization practices, or rigid categories in the abstraction of messy realities, or the view of data as objective, a given. And by looking at COVID-19 visualizations in mid-March of 2020, you could forget that these don't let us into the reality of the virus about to break loose across the United States, or that each of these circles abstracts away so many people who passed away from COVID, likely alone, in pain, and afraid. That is to say, unexamined data visualization efforts may be deeply damaging. And at the end of the day, as a data viz designer, I found my imagination of what data viz could do in tatters. At the beginning of this project, I needed a new way to think about data visualizations, to reorient my practice away from a tool of analysis and extraction. And two major theoretical shifts stood out. First, this work asserts that data visualization is ontological. That is, data visualization impacts how we talk about the world how we understand the world, and thus, how we relate to it. These COVID-19 charts shaped our imagination of the virus, and about those dying from it, and what we should do, and what we did. Second, we reclaim data, defining it as the phenomena a body observes. We draw from Haraway's situated knowledge and Morton's characterization of object-oriented ontology. As opposed to a single, best, objective way of sensing the world, Different cultures and communities produce their own ways of knowing about and relating to the world. Observation is situated in who is sensing and their culture and so on. And we must open up space for multiple ways of knowing about and relating to a world, or as some would define as a plurality. These theories sounded good, but how do you design data visualizations true to them? We embarked on a research through design project, creating Suga Convictio, an experimental data visualization for supporting community conversations in my master's cohort, which require attention to felt experience and fall apart under efforts of control. And from there, exciting results emerged. We began by looking to the bioregion where this project was created 
in the western Allegheny Plateau. I visited the gorgeous old growth forest filled with hemlock trees who share nutrients via roots and mycelium networks who help each other survive in community. Inspired, I aim to create a data collection process for community conversations that is reflective, poetic, and non-extractive. So I created a process that invites participants to reflect on their felt experience through the metaphor of growth of hemlock tree roots. They reflect using a hand gesture of reaching or clenching and can preserve their gesture as data using a phone's webcam, which uses a neural network regression to map hand movement to the vivaciousness of root growth. Through making this prototype, we discovered key takeaways. That creating data can be a process of observing and listening by carving out space and time to notice how the body feels and incorporating ecological narratives. We also sought ways of visualizing data towards helping us behold our interconnectedness in community conversations, creating a prototype that visualizes data through a generative system forest of hemlock trees, whose volume of root growth metaphorically represents the state of the community. In the prototype, each tree in the forest represents a community member, with their level of vivaciousness mapping to system behaviors that drive how enthusiastically each tree's roots grow. Through making this prototype, we discovered that we can choose which data to visualize to guide a particular kind of conversation. Even further, when we create data visualizations, we can create visuals that can give a deep, visceral understanding of our data by choosing an ecological metaphor brought to life with generative systems and ambiguous forms. These experiments help me begin picking up the pieces for what else data visualizations can do beyond extraction, beyond analysis, they revealed answers to some of the most fundamental questions designers like me implicitly and explicitly address when they collect data and create data visualizations. These practices and principles may help the field live up to its potential and reflect some of the trends that are already emerging. For example, by designing visualizations with ambiguity, we open ourselves to flexibility, avoiding the need to essentialize and obscure those who don't, as artist Jenny O'Dell asserts, fit squarely into one bucket or another. By designing visualizations for the felt experience of the body, they can more deeply resonate with the fundamental metaphor upon which all of our knowledge in language is based. Visualizations legible to our felt experience actually become more meaningful than their abstract geometric counterparts. By embracing work such as Soma Literate Design, we can talk about why data visualizations such as Henry Stevens' simulations of flattening the curve can help us viscerally understand what that actually means as opposed to a line chart. Finally, by designing data visualizations that use ecological metaphors inspired by our bioregion, we situate our design in meaning and context. We can appreciate and connect ourselves to the land we reside in, and are enabled through these metaphors to defy categories and to embrace the way non-human bodies move through the world. With these takeaways, we can begin talking about how to push forward our data visualizations, how to create visuals that, rather than control and fragment, can inspire, can engage, and transform us for the better. That is to say, this work offers a step towards a practice of crafting visualizations that help us behold instead of control. And I would argue that we critically need to address how data visualizations impact the world and how we relate to it. We must not only develop new practices that bring the bodies back to data viz, but also embrace how data visualizations can be a tool for deep understanding by feeling the entanglements in the world around us. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, so now we are going to uh, begin the live Q&A. So I see already there are a lot of questions. So here we have uh, Professor Sarah Sinmo, our keynote speaker, and then uh, Marius and Charlotte and Catherine. Thank you so much for coming, welcome. 
So um, I think we can begin with uh, Sarah's talk. Um, so there are some question in Discord. Um, so Eric asked, do the media companies ever directly engage with these types of Twitter hashtag campaigns? Hi, so they do actually. So after the Give Elsa a Girlfriend campaign started, the director, Jennifer Lee, or one of the directors of Frozen, Jennifer Lee said it was really important to include queer representation. And that's about as much as they said. They said it was, it was important for young people. It's important for current culture to be inclusive of LGBTQ representation. And they didn't exactly shut out the possibility that um, Elsa could have a girlfriend. And I think that's really important in Frozen 2. They don't give her a boyfriend. Um, they allow her to remain single and allow her to possibly have a love interest. But in the case of the Black Panther option with Io, Marvel actually responded and said they would refuse to give her a girlfriend. So depending on the media text and who the creators are of those particular films, they had kind of differing responses that way. That's great. Well, they are doing some, some in action. Uh, another question for Sarah. So your talk references mapping things out on Twitter, though each of the tweets seemed standalone without much discussion. Is there a discussion happening surrounding these hashtag campaigns? If so, would there be merit in visualizing the network influence slash discussion? So I absolutely think there would be merit in talking about the interrelationships between the hashtags. The kind of, the first part, part of this project was I just me like thinking about every single eight of the 8,500 tweets that were posted. What were they doing in terms of making an argument about queer identity and queer inclusiveness in Disney? But I think certainly the next steps would be to think about how they relate to each other, how they involve retweets, how they involve emojis. I haven't gotten to that step yet, but it's definitely something I'd like to think more about. Great, yeah. Um, another question for Sarah. So thank you for the great talk, Sarah. Since you mentioned this project is going on process, would you please tell us a little bit about the project is moving forward? So what is your plan for, yeah, next steps of this uh, project? So this is my second book project. And um, what you saw today is part of a chapter. So that chapter would be specifically about give Elsa a girlfriend and let Io from Black Panther have a girlfriend. One other chapter is about um, the character of Rey from Star Wars Awakens and the campaign to let Rey be asexual. Another chapter, because I have to talk about the haters, is the recast Batwoman campaign where they asked that Ruby Rose be recast. Interestingly, she has already been recast, but it's not due to the campaign. She voluntarily dropped out of the Batman series. And then um, there's also another chapter about other campaigns that aren't explicitly about Marvel or Disney that just deal with this hashtag of representation matters. We need diverse stories that are just a push to be inclusive of queer representation beyond these Marvel and Disney campaigns. So this is just the start of an ongoing project that I'm still kind of gathering data and thinking through what other hashtags might be included. Yeah, well, can't wait to see more the new chapters and then, yeah, the process. Um, any question for Sarah from the, the panels, panelists here? Any question or from other chairs? Okay. <laughs> well, we can kind of uh, move back and forth. Or, oh, Eri, you don't have a question? Or? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on, I, you know, I. I think it's really interesting when the big companies actually engage with these um, campaigns because, like you say, there can be lots of uh, sort of immediate um, reaction from a community this large and this reactive. Um, is there any evidence that the that the Frozen Two decision about keeping Elsa single was actually sort of um, influenced by this kind of campaign? Well. I think, I, I mean, I don't know, because I haven't talked to the <laughs> Disney execs, but I, my thought is that they could have given her a boyfriend and they chose not to. 
Yeah. So I feel like that choice opens up the identity of Elsa because when she isn't given a prince, essentially, she's allowed to be her own self that isn't necessarily dependent upon being in a relationship with a prince. And I think the fact that they even gave her a love interest is really important. Now, I'm sure there's going to be a Frozen 3 or a Frozen 4. <laughs> and I think this is a franchise that I can imagine will continue. So we'll see what happens. But I think even the choice, even though they don't publicly say she has a girlfriend, they don't give her a girlfriend or a kiss or a relationship explicitly in Frozen 2, the fact that they leave it open, I think is really important. And, yeah, I, and again, I'm not like in that room with the execs, but I think that choice to leave it open as opposed to the Marvel campaign that is not leaving it open by making a public statement, I think is really interesting. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of the, the, the biggest first step you can imagine from a media giant like Disney and yeah. you know tremendous progress in some ways, even though it's a tiny little step. Exactly, thanks. I actually also had a question. Um, I find your work really interesting. Um, will you be addressing like queer baiting? I think particularly with um, I think Disney's Beauty and the Beast, there was questions about queer baiting versus what the Disney was putting out like in um, public statements versus what was actually showing in the film. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important as well. So part of if I were giving you my longer, never ending presentation on representations of queerness in Disney, um, certainly this isn't the first time they've had a queer character, but I think the major difference is that in the case of Beauty and the Beast and other characters, they're usually secondary characters. And I think that's really important for the Elsa. It, for the Elsa example, she's the main character. Of course, for the Black Panther example, most people don't even know who Io is. She's just one of the warriors, Black Panther warriors. Um, but in Wakanda, but um, the concept, I think that Elsa is the main princess in Frozen and she's not given a girlfriend, I think is really important. Whereas a lot of these other examples that people refer to, it's about the secondary character. So I think that's also important is thinking about when it's the main princess, what does it mean? Or when it's Rey from Star Wars, what does it mean as opposed to these secondary characters, which is usually where queerness is allowed a lot more into the conversation. I guess the, the question is, isn't it queer baiting to like not give Elsa a girlfriend for, uh, explicitly? Um, so it allows like the queer fandom to be excited about the work without putting off the um, uh, more homophobic audiences? Yeah, I mean, China. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, de I definitely think it's a possibility. Like I, again, I feel like the big question is going to be if they frozen three frozen four do they allow her even more possibilities to engage with that queer narrative or do they stop after frozen two just because that was their response to all these campaigns and i think that's another interesting thing about the campaign is it's not it's not as popular as it was in 2016 it's not like there was as much conversation after frozen two came out as there was after frozen one came out so i think that's also kind of part of it yeah Thanks. Yeah, it's very meaningful talk, especially like influence to our children, you know, and then the whole education impact. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can actually move to um, the uh, Heartbeats group. So there's also questions. Um, uh, is the Heartbeats algorithm capable of visualizing mixtures of emotion? I take this question. So, our current prototype of heartbeats is only visualizing the eight primary emotions. And you can access our prototype and demo by going on the website of social-dynamics.net backslash heartbeats. And over there, you'll be able to see how different emotions, the eight primary ones look like based on our design. And to answer this question more precisely, the system is able is capable of visualizing mixed heartbeats by dividing the flocks into different groups of uh, different behaviors, basically. But that is not implemented yet in our current prototype. And what we have conducted experiments um, in our previous experiments, we basically uh, take 
we took the social media data by parsing and the content with natural language process processing, we are able to have the scores based on the content um, of we took the highest percentage of emotion that was expressed in the content, and then we project the highest visualization as the dominant visual, uh, the dominant emotions. So this is how the current system is done. But this in, yeah, in the future, after the second, um, second, second version will be able, we'll, we can experiment more with mixed emotions and so on. Thank you for the question. Great, yeah. Uh, another question is about data. So can you be more specific on how to distinguish specific emotions from the data of wearable devices? Where's the data coming from? Sure, maybe I take this question. So just to add uh, one more thing on Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte, for taking the question first. So just to add one more thing on what Charlotte <clears throat> mentioned uh, in our, our interface, also allows to tune the parameters so you can create your own uh, mixtures. So by varying the different parameters in the, in the interface and, and there, therefore you can just generate new visualizations so the boys can go in different directions and then this can illustrate a mixture of emotions if you like. So now to the second question, whether these data are coming from and where the wearables fit in this uh, picture so this is part of a, of a bigger vision, if you like. So I'm, I'm wearing now a watch, which is uh, like a consumer grade wearable that has this technology of allowing us to tap in people's physiology. So we can extract the uh, heart rate and heart rate variability. And these are physiological indicators that are related with how our, our human body works, like the autonomic nervous system, where there is plenty of literature over the last years where we surveyed the previous literature and found different physiological indicators from heart rate variability, for example, uh, RMSSD, the low HF in the frequency domain that are associated with different emotions. So taking these pointers from the previous literature, we try to, let's say we have a, a system where we get the, the, these indicators from the watch, then we have the mapping from the literature and then we translate based on uh, this nature inspired, uh, as Charlotte explained, visualization, we try to uh, tune these parameters of the Boyd's model in the visualization and then control uh, the, their behavior. So in a sense, think of like an example where like uh, 10 people in, in the workplace wear watches and then they can control how this visualization works. So for example, if uh, they're happy, then uh, these, these uh, boys are gonna align and go in, in one direction. Or so if something is, is more negative, then they may separate or their speed can increase and things like that to express a more negative emotion. Uh, does that answer the question or I should uh, clarify more? Please. Yeah, I think it's answered the question, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to jump in. Um, I yeah, want to sure. encourage um, people who are watching to go play around with this interface because it really is fascinating. It's fun to play with the sliders and see see how things change. Um, with with respect to the classic Boyd's algorithm for flocking, um, do you find do you think that that is sufficient for the kinds of emotions that you want to um, visualize? Did you discover any any um, limitations of the, the classic Boyd's flocking that you would like to, you know, extend to the next version? Um, well, first it's a, it's a research prototype. So more research is uh, definitely required to further tune the parameters. But uh, one thing that also Charlotte mentioned during her, her talk was like this observation on the negative emotions. So people were more um, uh, in, like attached to the, they, they could observe more like the negative ones. So this could be like either like how our uh, instinct when we see something negative or something that I express sadness or anger to be to relate more on that. But of course it downs to the how we tune the parameters. So further experiments need to be conducted. And, uh, and also the interface allows other researchers to play with uh, the parameter. And then uh, we can extend this, uh, this project further. 
And also if uh, anyone who is watching has any ideas on how we can move forward with this. Uh, so we've been thinking in the, in the context of workplace, whether for example, it could be an installation or um, how this visualization can give instant feedback of, for example, right now I'm presenting, I can see whether people wearing watches, whether all aligned to what I'm saying or, uh, or I need to change something on, on my, on my speech. So please feel Great, free to reach you. out to us and I don't want to take more time. Thanks. Yeah, in the Discord and the YouTube chat, uh, Marius shared the link to explore, you know, the beautiful demo. So please check it out. Uh, I think we can move to Catherine. Um, so it seems like Eric, you post a question. So could you maybe ask the question? Sure. Um, Catherine, I think, I think you were arguing that um, for this kind of um, this kind of information that the visualization should be more abstract and less directly um, analytical. So I wonder if you could talk about the kinds of information that you got out of these more abstract visualizations that maybe would have been obscured in a more specific analysis type of visualization. Absolutely. And I think the main strength there comes from how we respond to the ambiguity, right? Uh, in Bill Gaver's work, he shows that when we are presented with an ambiguous visual, for example, we move forward and create our own understanding of it. So we participate in that meaning making. And so in creating a data collection centered around this hand movement, uh, people must engage and think about, okay, what does that mean to me? How does this feel to move my hand? Uh, and that's sort of the space that I was playing in. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. I mean, I think um, as as humans, we make we're we're so willing to fill in the blanks when we see something ambiguous that it's a really powerful way of of expressing things. Um, so you know, just based on your talk and based on the Heartbeats talk, maybe you guys should talk because there's some there's some fascinating connections between sort of the ambiguous um, way that these emotions and the and the feelings of the group are expressed here. So really nice work. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. There's one more question for Catherine. So what are your thoughts on incorporating augmented reality or animation as a medium for abstract visualization? Both are potent areas of exploration, um, particularly animation. We're seeing a lot of, I guess, progress in this field. I saw um, recently, I think a collection by, I forget who's collecting these, but both offer us opportunities to viscerally connect, right? Augmented reality puts things into our own space, really tapping into that fundamental metaphor of the body in motion that we, I guess, place an abstract all meaning on top of. And animation, again, yeah, um, the example I gave in my talk was Harry Stevens and seeing commentary on that work, seeing the, the little dots representing bodies in motion lets us viscerally connect with that reality of disease spread, not necessarily captured by the lines. So absolutely two areas of, of potent possibility. Right, yeah, I think that'll be a really good addition. And then, um, okay, we have two minutes, uh, but Mika asked a question for Harpy's group. So murmurations are profoundly moving partially because of the negative space where the birds move through a gradient of color and landscape. Did you consider having representations of within the negative space? So kind of question about the negative space and motion. What do you guys think? Charlotte, do you want to, Charlotte? Yes, I'm still trying to understand the question fully. Um, negative space. So basically, uh, just to rephrase back to Mirka, if uh, she's uh, so basically the idea is whether we can uh, utilize different uh, colors and, um, and and the space in the canvas where we we use the where the boys are uh, flocking. So is that the, the question? I guess so. Yeah. So there are some. Um... Yeah, so kind yeah. of how you consider okay. because there's also uh, looking mo motions, but there's also negative space, how you yeah. do yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So I think it's a, it's a good question. So also if you go in our paper in, in the figure four, where we have the, the visual of the interface, 
where, where you can play with the different parameters. So we do have the, apart from setting the parameters of the voids, you can also experiment with the different aesthetics like the color, the gradient, whether it's a warm or more cold color. And then this can illustrate the, the different uh, behaviors. Uh, it's, this is not tested in the, in the previous study that we've done, but uh, it could also be part of the of further research. And then to add to the question um, which was asked, we, depending on, you know, our interpretation culturally um, as uh, in color psychology, the positive and negative emotions can be, um, can be divided with colors and expressed or enhanced by different uses of colors. This will also be our uh, further studied in, by us um, as previously we've only had been created co creating colors within bit by dividing warm and cold which you can explore on the prototype but so far we have not been using um, doing further testing on colors uh, and emotions individually yeah all right well i think we can wrap up the q a thank you so much yeah uh the authors and Sarah for answering all the questions. Um, yeah, great. And then um, I'll introduce you to see, uh, we will have a three invited artist talks. So the uh, first um, artist talk um, is about the, the beautiful artwork Cacophony uh, Core made by um, Hannah Ulf Sholin, Kiert Lee, Alex John Bondi. Um, yeah, so the, in the, the list, there is a kind of you know, it's not clear, but uh, yeah, we have actually uh, two uh, artists, um, yeah, presenting here. So yeah, there we go. Hi, my name is Hannah Wolf. I am an assistant professor of computer science at Colby College. Hi, I'm Alex Bundy. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at the venture technology company Opus Logica. Hi, I'm Sholan Kratle. I'm an architect and a PhD candidate at the Media Arts and Technology program at UC Santa Barbara. Cacophonic Choir is an interactive art installation, and it's about sexual assault survivors and media surge. Various types of mass media, like social media, news media, and so on, can be both empowering, as we saw in the hashtag MeToo movement, but at the same time, they can be toxic environments in which the information is continually distorted and abused. In either case, once a person shares their personal story, the story is oftentimes extremely overwhelming. And this is what we wanted to reflect with our work. The installation is composed of several embodied interactive agents distributed in space. Each agent has the ability to vocalize through a small loudspeaker and they each tell a story. The interaction is mainly proximity sensor based. From a distance, the participant hears these vocalizations as a kind of distorted murmur, each coming from an opaque membrane. This distortion and opaqueness both gradually yield to clarity as the participant approaches. The agent interface comprises three fundamental components based on different response modalities. The first one is a semantic response, that is, the word generation rendering the succession of words from incoherent to coherent. The second modality is a sonic modality, that is granular processing of the speech audio, rendering it from stuttery to clear. And the third one is the morphological modality, allowing for the modulation of the light source, rendering the form inside visible due to the translucent membrane. She started touching. So I noticed he was on my eye, so my best friend and how I was scared to say anything. He got into trouble as I knew I put my...
To express how stories of sexual assault are filtered through the news media, the stories that each agent tells is controlled by the distance a visitor is from an agent. When participants are more than two meters away, the agent randomly chooses words from a testimonial of a sexual assault survivor assigned to it. As the participant approaches, the words become less random and more coherent. To generate text, long short-term memory recurrent neural network models were pre-trained on over 500 stories of experiences of sexual assault from the When You're Ready Project website. For the final installation, we pre-generated text for 65 of the testimonials at each level of semantic clarity using models trained for longer periods of time to represent closer distances with a greater number of words from the original text as a seed. Once the visitor is less than half a meter away in the agent's personal space, the agent tells the original testimonial. This work was exhibited at Contemporary Istanbul's plug-in exhibition in September 2019. Initially, we were worried that the space we were given was not isolated sonically enough from other works, but it caused an interesting unintended interaction between visitors and the work. To hear the stories clearly, visitors had to be very close to a specific agent and place their ears directly next to it like it was whispering to them, creating a level of intimacy between the agent and the visitor. We can't exhibit cacophonic choir as originally planned, so we built a virtual installation of the work using Unity. The virtual version can be experienced online in the browser at cacophonic.net. We will continue exhibiting this work both in the digital and physical modality and plan to study the differences in the way that visitors interact with the work virtually and in person. All right, it's great talk, it's beautiful work, thank you. Uh, next invited artist talk is by Weidi Zhang. Uh, she will talk about her work, Volume of Voice. Volume of Voice is a set of data-driven artifacts that is generated based on the voice between objects and human bodies. Inspired by the current COVID-19 pandemic situation, people are keeping social distance to overcome the invisible enemy, coronavirus. It influences the way people live, communicate, and social in a profound way. When people keep the distance from objects and other people, what is the shape of those invisible spaces? Volume of Voice provides an artistic response to those questions by using photogrammetry techniques to capture multiple pandemic scenes volumetrically, implementing algorithmic strategies to create data-driven artifacts of the emptiness in the scenes, and 3D print them as sculptures. This project echoes with the Japanese concept of Ma. Ma in Japanese culture refers to artistic interpretation of emptiness. It draws people's attention to a negative space which helps to perceive the positive space. The empty space is often full of possibilities. The concept of Ma is also reflected in artistic practices of calligraphy. Chinese and Japanese calligraphy not only focuses on the depiction of the characters, but also creates careful relationships between the forms of characters and the surrounding non-form. Calligraphy artists using blankness to link forms and take the design of those voice spaces into artistic considerations. This project also resonates with Asian Chinese philosophy, yin yang. The beings and non-beings produce each other. Volume of voice implement the concept of Ma and Yin Yang by rethinking the meanings of space between, the message those silent spaces deliver, and how the voice influences the intricate networks of society. There are mainly three steps of methodology, data collecting, visualization strategy, and 3D fabrication. 
inspired by various social distancing-related news reported on social press. Different scenes are staged and captured volumetrically by using photogrammetry techniques. Thus, point clouds of position data, X, Y, Z data, are generated. The XYZ points generated by photogrammetry techniques are used to create multiple boundary edge curves on their XY planes. Those curves are later implemented to create planar surfaces with the different Z axes. The planes are connected, lofted, and controlled by different algorithms such as Bezier and Perlin noise. The reason to add those mathematical algorithms to the z-axis curves is to add uncertainties to the constructions of those sculptures. The world is constantly moving, while those invisible spaces between us are unstable, fluid, and unpredictable. The data-driven sculptures are printed in PETG clear filament and placed on the 4-inch LED pedestals. The organic artifacts are not only a poetic visualization of the invisible border between people, but also a critical response to the transformation of human networking under a historical pandemic. The volume of voice aims to provide a collective feeling of alienation between different beings by using experimental visualization that sustains our curiosity and reflection. Thank you very much for listening. Great talk. Okay, so we have a last invited artist talk uh, presented by the Jia Bao Li. So she will talk about her work on Finnish farewell. As COVID-19 spreads across the globe and the number of deaths continues to rise, the heartbreaking experiences are being replaced by collective mourning. The death of one man is a tragedy. The death of millions is a statistic. When we look back to the help-seeking posts of those lost, those who waited to die because of unconfirmed testing, those whose death certificates are being tampered with, those who committed suicide out of despair, those non-COVID patients whose life-saving medical treatment was foregone. None of them were included in the death toll and are likely to be forgotten over time. They didn't have a fair medical treatment during their lifetime, and they were not mentioned after their death. The same is true for many frontline workers who lost their lives due to infection or overwork. While connecting with families of those lost, one daughter asked, after this pandemic, who can remember the pain of someone like my mother, who had nowhere to seek medical treatment, was refused by the hospital, and died at home? This is one of the reasons why we built this online platform, trying to document as many people who have left us because of the pandemic as possible. The website also includes the help-seeking information they posted before they passed away, which is the evidence they left to this era. We hope to provide a space for family members to release their grief and for the public to mourn. Behind every number is the life. Here we try to gather the portrait for each disease. You've never met this person, but their portrait is right in front of you. But then you realize that they passed away. As soon as your finger lingers on the person's face, it scatters and vanishes. We haven't had a chance to really get to know this person, and they just fade away. We design the website this way so that when visitors enter the space, they can sense that sort of atmosphere, the sorrow, grief, melancholy, mourning, and agony. A comparable feeling that visitors can have, as if they are physically visiting their tomb. This gives us much more understanding of death than the increasing statistics. Enter each individual space by clicking farewell. You can see the help-seeking information they posted before they passed away. You can leave a message. All the messages people send here will float in the space. 
here are some messages we've received since publishing. Do I need to shout loudly to be noticed? The best memory of the disease is not to lose memory in your lifetime. RIP, hope you can change your job if you become policeman again. This is a message to a cyber police who passed away out of overwork for deleting sensitive messages on the internet. Can I understand? Don't understand. To the whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang. Because of your existence, I will always learn to love humankind. I hope I can at least know your name, not just the unknown name. May you rest in peace. Yan Cheng, after you leave, your dad and brother still push your wheelchair to eat together with you. No freedom to speak, no freedom to die. Someone uploaded her grandmother's information who passed away to our website and wrote how much she misses her. Thank you, Grandma, and thank you for seeing me as more than your life. Grandma, you must take care of yourself. Please rest assured and I will take care of this home. Grandma, I really miss you. Grandma, I love you. Besides the grand narratives of how successfully we are conquering this disease, we hope to use this project to retain these painful memories of the ordinary people. More or less recover the feeling of death at that time. Those who are outside of the statistics, at least they left some traces for us to understand more about death. There are various ways of visualizing the statistics of COVID, but none about individual story. This project provides one way for us to visualize and relate to death. Please visit farewell.care to learn more. All right. Um, so now we are uh, beginning the live Q&A. So we have uh, three artist groups and then, um, yeah, so we already have some questions in Discord. So it would be great to start with the cacophonic uh, core. So there's a question. So thank you for the talk and treating work. Since we can experience the work, uh, would you tell us more about the silicone sculpture and the speaker designs? Sholen and Hannah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll take this one. Um, so the the designs of the silicone and the sculpture are not necessarily data driven, but they have to do with the entire concept. What we're trying to um, convey here is, which is the we're using the distance um, between the object and the audience as a metaphor for, you know, the um, the distance. Uh, from the renditions uh, of the story to the original story, if you will, or the distortions of the story to the original story. Um, and so it follows the same concept. So um, we have these uh, 3D designed, um, parametrically designed and fabricated shapes inside these silicon membranes. Um, and these shapes are uh, they're not data driven, but they're mathematical shapes are based on the N upper surface, which is a minimal surface. Um, and they have slight variations, each and every one of them. We have nine agents. Um, and these are, like I said, um, uh, these are inside this soft silicone uh, transistor membrane. Um, and one of the ideas is that A, like they're from outside, from a distance, they all kind of like look similar. But as you're approaching, you can see the individual differences because each of these shapes are slightly different and they're burst. Some of them are bursting out of these membranes. Some of them are fully um, enclosed by the membranes. The other thing that's happening is that the membranes are translucent and the uh, there are there's an LED light inside each and every one of them. And as you're getting closer, the translucent membrane, the light gets brighter from in, within and the membrane gets uh, more and more transparent at revealing the form inside. And so, um, the whole concept of, okay, you're getting closer to an agent, you're like listening the story from the first hand, it's getting clearer to you, like we're applying to the audio and the semantics of the story, stories, um, but also uh, the way it visually looks, right? So from further, these are, you know, like almost like opaque-ish membranes are translucent, but the shapes are getting clearer and clearer 
because of the illumination as you get closer. Um, yeah, we manually fabricated the, the membranes themselves um, and the, um, the shapes inside them uh, that were parametric shapes um, were uh, 3D um, printed. So I don't know if this answers the question, but. Yeah, I think it is answer uh, the question. Uh, there's another similar kind of follow question about um, so that the viewers discover on their own that the stories became more clear as they approach it, or did they uh, need a prompt to understand the modality? And also as a little bit more, I'm kind of curious, you know, there's some agent, but I'm wondering, you know, how the experience um, is changing when they actually rotated around the sculpture and the, do they listen differently or, yeah, so curious about the modality and the uh, user experience basically. Yeah, um, so at the exhibition um, in Turkey, people seemed very intrigued by the sculptural forms. And then they realized when they were very close that they could hear the specific stories. So they were kind of lured in by these glowing orbs and, and intrigued by them. And then once they were kind of brought in, then they would actually hear these bits and pieces of, of stories that were were more emotionally charged and then when they were very close they could hear the original stories um because the uh, work was actually exhibited in a, an environment that was louder than we really had designed it for um people would actually get quite close uh frequently putting their ears next to the the 3d printed object that was bursting out of the uh silicone membrane so it was like they were almost like being whispered to um, as they were listening to these objects. Um, and I think Yoon, Yoon's questions specifically was, um, how does the interaction differ? Um, so the way that we exhibited it, it, it in this environment was there was actually really only one side that had the proximity sensor. And that was also the side that frequently had the object bursting out of. So it kind of created a front that they could approach from. In the 3D virtual environment that we um, have online at cacophonacquire.net, in that one, um, it's uh, responsive from all four sides. Uh, so if you approached it from kind of a side that was not the front in the, in the actual exhibition, it would be less responsive. Um, though we plan to, in continual modifications of the work, have it be responsive from all four sides. Great. Um, yeah, I was really looking forward to see, but it's really unfortunate we couldn't have that work this year. And I know I saw that you guys are presenting at SIGGRAPH this year too, so congrats on all the shows. Um, we have a tight schedule, so I'll jump to the ladies and then we can kind of move back and forth, by the way, yeah. Uh, there's a question um, for Wadi. So uh, beautiful work. Can you give one specific example of what two objects slash entities the negative space in between? Um, so basically, this um, the data collecting process is actually inspired by um, various social distancing related news. For example, I saw news that um, some people are afraid to touching. Starbucks coffee cups directly by hand. So we, uh, because uh, we, uh, we cannot capture um, the uh, photogrammetry data in the Starbucks. Um, so we have to stage at home with a, a model and, uh, and also a co coffee cup with the, with the space between. Uh, so basically we stage this thing at home and some of the thing, uh, we also went to the public park and to, uh, capture two people sit on a stool with a certain distance and under their permission, we would be able to collect the photogrammetry data of them. Got it, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another question for you. Um, so it seems like uh, there's a question about the viewer's experience. So um, uh, this work seems to me to connect to the previous talks about abstraction and visualization. Have you talked with the viewers to see what they think? when they see the, the shapes, do they, uh, do you know that what narratives viewers make of when they see these uh, sculptures? Um, I think 
most um, unfortunately most visitors uh, uh, when they see this those models they cannot tell um, it's the spacing between different beings but after they re, uh, read the abstraction uh, abstract I wrote and also my introduction they can uh, start to imagine like what kind of um, what kind of uh, what is the the object what what is the space between uh, and what, what kind of objects they are. And they are in, their answers are quite different. And I think that's the intention for this project because we want to leave the space to imagine and also um, trying to blur the abstraction and the concrete uh, data visualization. Great, and, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think we can move to Jiabao. Um, so there are two questions for Jiabo. So how is the data archived and how do you make sure this data remains for generations? Yeah, very good question. Um, so far, how we pass it through the through generation is kind of manual. Uh, um, I'll keep it, we'll maintain it on the server, uh, we'll maintain the website. Um, and yeah, so we will pass along through our generation. Um, yeah, and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and then another question is, uh, do you have a plan to have version for other countries, cultures, and languages? Uh, yeah, we would like to uh, like start from US. Uh, the thing is collecting the data in a very um, comprehensive way is um, it's kind of, um, we need to work on that. Um, yeah, so like, I guess like New York Times have a, a collection. Um, so we could start from there. Yeah. But the, the, the point about uh, starting from the Chinese is we have the help seeking information. Um, and there's also this, this um, special thing about the language as well. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, uh, COVID-19 is ongoing thing. And then probably there will be a lot of things you can depict and then, but it's really beautiful work. And then, yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, there's one extra question for Cacophonic uh, Core. Have you thought about adding other visual cues such as color changes along with the audio to draw people close? About the not really we were pretty set on keeping the visual cues to a minimum um as, as best as we can from the get-go because we really wanted the focus to be the stories themselves um and not you know not overcharge or not over emphasize the um the visual aspects with colors and and such so um yeah so the audio and the stories themselves so we wanted to uh, we wanted for the center focus to be on. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. All these three artworks right now is all black and white. You know, there's actually no color. <laughs> it's all presented by in a grayscale, which is super powerful. Yeah, uh, work. Um, oh, Thomas, so ask question uh, for Cacophony. How did you approach the theme of sexual assault? What brought you to that? So what was the, uh, your inspiration? How, what was your approach? And then kind of some story behind of it? Um, yeah, I think I can cover that. Um, so the, the question is, how did we come to the idea of uh, looking at stories of sexual assault? Um, and I think par partially this comes from uh, our own experiences dealing with seeing all of this media on, um, on social media during the Me Too movement, ha hearing all of these stories showing up on Twitter and on Facebook of people's experiences of sexual assault and the deluge of the flood of hearing all these stories um, and trying to reproduce that experience of, of um, being overwhelmed by all of these stories of sexual assault and the hashtag Me Too movement um, and create a kind of visual and audio 
of visualization sonification of that experience. I'm not sure if Sherlyn wants to say anything. No, that was excellent. I don't know if it would help to say that we are both also sexual assault survivors ourselves. So in, in a way we were, you know, facing our own experiences or maybe like um, translating them to a degree. But. Right. I think all the three uh, our talks uh, present today touch a lot of actually really good uh, important topics. It's very timely, uh, very important and um, yeah, social issues and yeah, it's really great. So I think we have to wrap up for this session. Thank you so much uh, for all these panelists and then, you know, paper authors, uh, keynote speaker, artist. It's really actually great to have you today. And then thank you for answering all the questions. And also uh, thank you uh, participants uh, who came this early morning and then, you know, uh, participated in this session. So we have one more paper session tomorrow at the same time, eight o'clock in the morning and mountain time. So please come. And then, yeah, check out more um, paper and the pictorial uh, presentations and artist talks. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the whole conference virtually. Yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Rendering large volumetric data sets is still a challenge for real-time applications. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just render the data set at a low screen resolution and your neural network upscales it to the full resolution again? We propose a network architecture that does exactly that and can outperform a full resolution rendering for large data sets. For quantitative and qualitative evaluations, come to our talk. The Make of Continuous Color Maps. We present the CCC tool, a new web tool for the creation, editing and analyzing of application-specific color maps. For the precise definition of color maps, we developed a new color map specification. This new structure increases the editability by reducing the numbers of colors to a minimum. Usual collaborative systems propose the public and private environments the latest processing visibility rights. Subjective views are special objects perceived differently per user. However, a break in the social space may happen during exploration. Our visualization context tries to link efficiently multiple relative visualizations together around a common object. We discussed about the designs of a stacking layout, virtual leaking layout, and a mix between them. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Comparative layout are the visualization arrangement to support visual comparison tasks. To better understand them, we conducted a systemic survey on 127 research papers. Based on the survey, we suggest a lucid classification, as well as diverse practical implications that help you better design comparative visualizations. Find out more in our presentation. Providing insights is the main purpose of visualization. A lot of systems automatically communicate insights to users, but we don't really understand a lot about the space of these automated insight tools. We conducted a review of 20 automated insights tools and proposed a framework of the types of automated insights and the purposes of providing auto insights 
Take a look at our paper to learn more. Typically, black hole visualization takes a lot of compute time, but we achieve a quite faithful reproduction at interactive rates on a standard computer. For this, we make use of a novel adaptive grid approach to focus calculations where needed. Coupled with filtering and interpolation methods, we can obtain high quality imagery. Our approach accepts star catalogs and environment maps and generates the resulting deformations in real time. Many real-world analysis environments involve multiple types of experts and analysts working together. We aim to provide new knowledge about the role of provenance in a variety of data analysis scenarios. We present the findings from interviews with the data analysts from various domains. Our results demonstrate how different needs for provenance depend on different analyst roles and also helps to identify possible opportunities for advancements and new techniques for provenance support. We present three external labeling concepts that allow a user to browse through point sets without the need of zooming in and out. In the first method, labels are distributed on multiple pages. The next method arranges the labels in a single row that can be continuously slid along the bottom side of the map. In our third method, labels are distributed on stacks which a user can independently browse through. In interdisciplinary visualization research, scholars browse collections of scientific papers searching for existing methodologies that can be imported into their own domains. In this short paper, we implement a document exploration prototype that employs distribution and similarity between author assigned keywords to detect potential methodology transfers between two collections of research papers. If you want to know more, please read our paper. What is insight? It is a question that has bothered visualization researchers for a long time. We are wondering whether visualization practitioners think about data insights in the same way as visualization researchers do. So we interviewed 23 visualization practitioners to understand how they think. To find out more about what we found and the implications to the visualization community, take a look at our paper. Large displays are beneficial for visualizing vast amounts of data. However, there are challenges regarding perception, personalized views, and managing data complexity. To address these issues, we propose to combine large interactive displays with personal augmented reality. We present a design space, as well as several visualization techniques, such as curving the whole screen, embedded visualizations, and many more. We propose a novel visual analytics system for optimizing bus networks. The system helps users first analyze bus network performance and identify problematic routes. Then, the alternative to a selected routes can be obtained in real time. By evaluating these routes with our system, the users can efficiently decide which one is the best and improve the bus network. University directories routinely become outdated and often lack the information necessary for understanding a researcher's interests and past work. To assist in the exploration of research talent, we have designed PeopleMap, an interactive tool that maps out researchers using NLP techniques. By using PeopleMap, users can explore the diversity of research at an institution and identify potential research talents.
Dimensionality reduction is an important tool for the visual exploration of complex high-dimensional data. Most existing techniques focus on preserving the intrinsic geometry of the data during the projection. However, important information can be included within the global structure of the data. To address this, we present TopoMap, a dimensionality reduction method that provably preserves the topological features of the data during the projection. While the prior work has examined how visualization impacts decision making, there is no concrete method for quantifying and comparing the impacts of different encodings on decisions. We rethink how we evaluate decision making with visualizations by leveraging work from economic theory. We present the results of a large scale lottery game that evaluates the impact of five different visualization designs on risk behavior and decision making. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. This study presents a method to explore hierarchical data by improving RODVIS, one of the visualization techniques for multidimensional data. The user can set options for nodes and check the data in groups or individually in the RODVIS. Three subviews at the right enable the hierarchical clustering structures of selected data and allow the user to grasp the features of selected data. As a result, this system allows more detailed insight into the data while solving the node overlapping problem.
We propose a novel vision analytics system for optimizing bus networks. The system helps users first analyze bus network performance and identify problematic routes. Then, the alternative to a selected routes can be obtained in real time. By evaluating these routes with our system, the users can efficiently decide which one is the best and improve the bus network. DataBreeze is a multimodal visualization system that lets people interact with unit visualizations using pen, touch, and speech. By supporting multimodal interaction, allowing users to manipulate, refine, and customize the view, DataBreeze enables a novel, fluid, and flexible data exploration experience, enabling a seamless transition between global and local level data exploration, spanning the entire data set or a subset of the data. In our talk, we will introduce a didactic methodology for crafting interactive visualizations. This methodology uses a construction kit that describes a visualization using a set of building blocks. Our approach contains three successive steps that can assist students and anyone interested in crafting, ranking, and improving new visualization ideas. We propose V2V, a comprehensive pipeline for variable selection and translation for multivariate time varying data. Our approach contains feature learning, translation graph construction, and variable selection. To demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach, we compare histogram matching, pixel to pixel, and CycleGAN to evaluate variable translation. In addition, we also compare an information-aware framework to evaluate variable selection. When doing the cell division for an embryo, plant biologists use several tools to get segmented 3D dataset and build 